Once again, I want to thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'm thankful to the Lord. I said many years ago, I will go where I'm invited. Thanks, so thank you again. You know, I remember uh, five years ago, last December, that um, I went to preach a sermon in my old home church up in Prince George, B.C., hello everybody, that um, it was arranged that I was, we were visiting there, my, uh, my dad for the Christmas time, and uh, I thought maybe it would be nice if I could preach up there, and they, uh, some friends talked to the pastor, they arranged the whole thing, and it was done. I remember uh, that week before that... Um, Leo and I talked, my wife, and uh, she said, why don't we ask your dad if he wants to go? I said, I never thought of it. So we asked my dad to come to church and hear me preach. And uh, he said, yeah, I would like to. So then we got home. We were staying at my sister's place. When we got there, we said, we asked dad to uh, come to church this Sabbath and hear me preach. Do you want to come too? And she said, yeah. So... Uh, and I remember standing in the pulpit, in God's pulpit, when the, one of the back doors to the sanctuary opened and my father and my sister came in. And I grew ten sizes. And, uh, and my dad was so happy, he was so proud of his son. And I thought, as, as, I, as I did that, what a way to honor your father. Um, and I was thinking this last week as I was kind of going over this, and that thought came to my mind of my dad coming to church to see me preach, that the words just kept going over and over in my head. I will honor my father. I will honor my father. I will honor my father. And I said that to myself out loud to God. So I honor my father on earth, and I want to honor my father in heaven also. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. And the Bible says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So in the beginning, when God made everything, he said it was very good. Now I want to read uh, Genesis chapter 2, parts of Genesis chapter 2, and it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Now this is what God has said was very good. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Keep this in mind as we're talking today about our subject, Gone Astray. Verse 4, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. That's interesting. God waited until there was a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed it into his nostrils, let me say that again, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. 
And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted, and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is, it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, there is bdellium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now let us skip over to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, and we'll go to verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked. And I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now one morning I wondered, why do God's people have the tendency to wander away from him? And I told my wife, and I said, I'm wondering why... God's people have a tendency to go astray. And she said, don't bother trying to figure it out. You know, I had a friend one time, when I actually, when I first joined the church, and there was a friend of mine who had grown up in the church all their life, and they said, you know, I never got to be rebellious when I was a child. And I thought, I just came into this wonderful group of people, and you want to rebel? I said, what's, what's the matter? Why do you want to start now? You know, rebellion is not all it's cracked up to be. Now, what happened to Adam and Eve affects us all. God's people run away, and God spends his life to bring us back. There was no reason to leave. There was no reason to disobey. Well, they were tempted, but in fact, the one who tempted them first went astray in heaven. Again, no reason. And, you know, the saying, misery loves company, he could not go alone. But you know what? Getting a bunch of miserable people together doesn't give them joy. It only increases the misery. But running away from God, it makes neither God nor his people happy. And God knows that our happiness consists in loving, obedient service to him. And like my friend who wanted to rebel, I would say, don't do it. You got it made. You got it made here. And God gives it all, of, gives it all to you to keep you there. And if you go astray, he gives it all to you to bring you back. What do you have in God's fold? Well, let's make a list, shall we? We like making lists, don't we? What do you have in God's fold? God himself Angels, love, peace, unity, fellowship, security, shelter, clean air to breathe, 
clean, pure water to drink, and wholesome food to eat. He said in Psalm 23, Thou leadest me in green pastures. You make me to lie down in green pastures, and you lead me beside the still waters. In his presence there is healing of body and mind. And with him you have nothing to worry about. What do you have outside of God's fold? We we'll make another list. Satan, his devils, wicked men, hatred, strife, desire for supremacy, fear, anxiety, distractions, disease, loneliness, and pain. You name an undesirable condition and you will find it out there. Does that sound attractive? Hmm? And in case you're tempted, this is what you have waiting for you. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and starting in verse 19, we have another list of things that God tells people that they will so-called enjoy if they run away. Galatians 5.19 Nobody likes to read this list, so they skip over it, but here it is. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, that's what you have waiting for you outside of God's fold. And when you come to your senses, and the Lord brings you back, this is what you can look forward to. Still in Galatians 5, go to verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then down in verse 22 and 23, another list. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. What do you have outside of God's fold? What do you have inside of God's fold. When I was young, we played a game called Follow the Leader. Does anybody remember that game? Oh, yes. You know, one person is a leader, and everybody else has to do everything that leader does or says. And it struck me, is that part of why God's people go astray? Because they are following someone that's going astray. People follow the leader. They follow the science. They follow the money. You follow a trail. We follow our instincts. We follow clues. We follow orders. We follow plans. We follow steps. We follow instructions. We follow the crowd. We follow an itinerary. And we follow a line of reasoning as you are doing with me right now, we follow our master, and probably the number one thing that people like to follow is follow your heart. <laughs> Jeremiah 17 verse 9 tells us not to do that. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? <laughs> desperately wicked deceitful above all things I can't follow that now if I'm supposed to follow my heart my heart can't wait to be wicked that's what it's telling me desperately wicked and not only do I want to be wicked I want to be more wicked than I was yesterday I can't wait to find ways that are more wicked than I've ever been before isn't that what it's talking about God's people can't wait 
to be wicked. That's weird to me. But it started a long time ago, didn't it? Did it not? In Genesis chapter 6. And verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. How was it? It was great. Now we use that word in a different way, I think. Wickedness isn't great. But it was so great that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Desperately wicked. Great in the earth. Every imagination. Ed, how many is that? <laughs> there wasn't a single thought that man had that was not wicked. There wasn't a single thing that man wanted to do that was not evil. And Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And, in case you haven't noticed, we have arrived. Now, how can Seventh-day Adventists claim that as a badge of honor when really it is a garment of shame and disgrace? The devil and his false shepherds have dragged us out and paraded us before the world as did the false shepherds in Christ's day when they dragged that woman into the temple to see him. What a spectacle but what an opportunity for God's people to show forth the praise of God and His power to save. Where have God's people gone astray? May I share this with you from The Great Controversy, page 595, paragraph 1. The opinions of learned men. The deductions of science. The creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent. The voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Have you followed me so far? Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, in its support. So in a manner of speaking, when somebody comes along with a point of doctrine or religious faith that we don't agree with, because it doesn't sync with what God is saying in his word, it says we should meekly ask for a plain, thus saith the Lord, in its support. What does the word demand mean? Now, I don't think that God's servant was using that in an overbearing sense. No. But God's people, hear me now, God's people have a right to demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, when somebody says, this is what God wants you to do. Don't you think? You have that right. God gave you that right. You have certain unalienable rights, which are given to you by your Creator. When you acknowledge Him as your Creator, you would understand that you are not the only one that has those rights. That everybody has them. And when somebody comes to me and says, you no longer have the right to breathe, well, some of the thoughts that go through my mind are characteristically unchristlike. When you ask the question, why have God's people gone astray? Sometimes there doesn't seem to be an answer. 
But in that paragraph we just read out of the Great Controversy, page 595, paragraph 1, we find that they have followed opinions. Now, somebody asked me once about something that was a Bible subject. What's your opinion on that? I said, I don't have one. I don't have an opinion on what God said. It's not up to me to tell you what God said. Number one, is it because the person that was asking me is too lazy to figure it out for themselves? That may be the case. Uh, I do not have an opinion on what God said. I just have obedience. That is what I need. Are you going to do it? That's my opinion. Deductions. Okay, that's where people think things up, right? Isn't that, isn't that the case? Um, we read something. It's plain in God's Word. What did He really say? Eve had deductive powers. And Satan encouraged that. Did God really say that? Creeds. What's a creed? That's where somebody tells you what to believe. Right? It's written out. You agree to it. You check that little box before you can download your program. Right? You've seen that? You have to agree and sign the box, and then you can download your program. It's a creed. Somebody has told you what to believe. You do not have a mind of your own. This is what you believe, and you will believe it, or you are not one of us. Decisions of councils and committees. Fun question for you. What would a horse have looked like if God asked a committee to design it? I heard that once. If God had asked a committee to design a horse, it would have looked like a camel. Sometimes... The decisions of councils and committees is not the way to go. If a committee is representative of the body of people who it claims to represent, then the decision of that committee should reflect the will of the greater number of people. When it does not, let me just say this, it's invalid. How about the majority? Majority rules, right? You have 100 people, 51 people want to do this, the other 49, tough luck, buddy. They say, they, whoever they are, say that this is a democracy. Do you know what a democracy is? If you have a bigger mob than the other guy, you're in charge. It's a republic. And a republic guards the rights of the individual against the majority. And that's not political. It's just real. So, when God's people follow opinions, deductions, creeds, councils, committees, the majority, they tend to go astray. How many rules of faith do we have? We have one. We have one rule of faith. What did Jesus say when he spoke to the devil in the wilderness? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What's our rule of faith? The word of God. Thus saith the Lord. And you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, have the right and the duty to demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, when somebody comes along and tells you, this is what you believe.
Do people go astray because they have been led there? Here's a story for you about being led astray. 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. And I, I, I like God's sense of humor when he tells this story. I start in verse 13. You know, the preamble to this is where Ahab was going to war with Syria and he wanted some help, so Jehoshaphat came over and they met. And they uh, were wondering, well, should I go to war or should I not? And Ahab had 400 false prophets that said, go ahead. It's interesting that the Bible identifies them as false prophets. And they said, go ahead, for the Lord will give them into your hands. Okay? And interestingly enough, Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we can inquire of? Did Jehoshaphat, did Jehoshaphat know that the advice of those 400 prophets was not real? Well, he says, let a prophet of the Lord speak. In verse 13 of 1 Kings chapter 22, And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like, one, like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. <laughs> and the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? Now here's a man who spent his life running away from the truth of God, and he would have nothing to do with it, but he tells God's prophet, I'm telling you in the name of the Lord to tell me the truth. How many times do I have to tell you to tell me the truth? Well, what have I been trying to tell you all these years, king? Come on. So tell me the truth. In verse 17, he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me, but evil? And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. This is Micaiah speaking. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail. Also go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. Ahab, they are leading you astray. And you, by your example, are leading, have led the whole nation of Israel astray. But Zedekiah, the son of Jenaath, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back 
unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison, and feed him with bread of affliction, and with water of affliction, until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. Is it possible that there have been lying spirits speaking from the mouth of false prophets? And is it possible that God's people have been listening to those lying spirits? It is certainly possible. And I think we have seen the result of that. Now where does God lead his people? We read Psalm 23 earlier. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He takes me to what I need to eat. He takes me to what I need to drink. Psalm 80, verse 1. You know, some of these names are hard to pronounce. I'm going to give it a go. To the chief musician upon Shoshana Meduth, a psalm of Asaph. Give ear, old shepherd of Israel. Who did he call him? He called him the shepherd of Israel. Thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. Amen. We recognize that God is our shepherd. We also read earlier Isaiah 40, verse 11. Shall we read it again? Isaiah 40, verse 11. Who is our shepherd? God is our shepherd. Isaiah 40, verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. God as our shepherd. But in spite of God's Loving, caring, leading, people still go astray. Why? Because they choose to? They want to? Are they bored? You think boredom is a good reason? I had someone say one time, it was in a class I was taking in college, they say you do not get bored, you bore yourself. Maybe some people think that God is boring. I don't. I like the routine of getting together with Him every day. I'm not bored. God is exciting, God is supremely exciting. I think that just because he talks to us at all is something else. In Luke 15, Jesus told a parable of the lost sheep. I just picked this one because it, it more keenly focuses in on the idea of him as being a shepherd. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost." 
I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. The shepherd did not wait for the sheep to come home. The shepherd went out looking for the sheep. The sheep was in trouble. And the shepherd couldn't stand to let that sheep remain in trouble any longer. As soon as he knew there was one missing, he went out, left the comfort of his home, and went out. Christ's Object Lessons, page 198, paragraph 1. I read these words. The parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son bring out in distinct lines God's pitying love for those who are straying from Him. Although they have turned away from God, He does not leave them in their misery. He is full of kindness and tender pity toward all who are exposed to the temptations of the artful foe. I like to read those words over and over again and pick out some things, not like I am dissecting and analyzing what God said through Ellen White, but there are things that jump out at you. When, when you turn away from God, it's a choice. It's a deliberate, purposeful, intentional choice. It's not an accident. You may, people make up their minds to go, right? And, um, but it, it says that turning away from God leaves them in misery. But God does not leave them in misery. If God comes looking for you, right? Now when God finds you, how can you be miserable? Hmm? It says that in his presence are, is joy evermore. Something like that. He's full of kindness and tender pity toward all who are exposed to the temptations of the artful foe. He knows what the devil's up to. The devil succeeds to a certain point. But God does not leave that soul uncontested, does he? And we can be thankful for that because we would all be dead. And we would have no hope. God is full of kindness and tender pity toward us. So why go astray? Like that friend that wanted to rebel. I couldn't figure it out. I was just getting to know God. Why do you want to run away? I don't understand. I still can't. And so I go back to Ezekiel chapter 34, where it talks about God having a controversy with the people who were supposed to be leading his people. And um, he says this in verse 5. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Verse 8. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherd search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. It's getting worse. God's not letting up on them. Oh Lord, please have mercy. This is mercy. I'm telling you what your problem is. And just because sometime in the past that I appointed you to lead my people doesn't give you carte blanche to do whatever you want with them. I did not make you a dictator. I made you a shepherd. Do your job! Just do what I told you, and you and my sheep will be fine. But we couldn't do it. Verse 12. 
as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Verse 23. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. God has very distinctly laid out what the shepherd is supposed to do. And it's being like him. But when people whom he has appointed to do that refuse, you know, I almost said fail, but sometimes that's accidental, isn't it? But it's not an accident. It is no accident. You know the Apostle Paul said that of your own selves, people will rise up speaking perverse things. You're not going to escape. You're not immune. Hmm? But God still has faithful people who give his message. And I read in uh, the Review and Herald, June 25th, 1901, paragraph 15, the message God sends through his servants will be scorned and derided by unfaithful shepherds who tread down with their feet the feed of the pastures, giving the flock as food that which they have defiled. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. No outward nearness to God will screen from divine wrath those who trample under their feet the law of Jehovah. Now there is the first time I had ever seen connected the green pastures with God's law. What is the green pasture? It's God's law. It's his word. And people are trampling that underfoot and feeding us with what's left. <clears throat> We're having a fellowship meal after this. How would you like it if somebody took a dish off the table, put it on the floor, and stomped all over it, and then said, here, enjoy. That's what's happened. It's what happened. And they say, enjoy. And God's people can say, I'm not eating that slop. Give me the pure word of life. Give me the pure water of life. I don't have to eat that. They tread it down with their feet and defile it. And I'm not saying that. God said it. And some people think that's strange. But it isn't. Does God know what's going on? Yeah. Read Ezekiel chapter 8 and 9. Who do we trust for our salvation? We trust the Lord himself, don't we? But when people trust their salvation to the minister or to an organization or any such thing, they will go astray with him. Their trust in the hireling is misplaced. And they are surprised, they are scattered and overtaken 
and destroyed when the minister leaves them to the wolves. And at what point does the sheep, in this case the church member, realize that he is in trouble? In the parable that Jesus told of the prodigal son, the Bible says he came to himself. The Holy Spirit worked on him until he knew where he was, and it was not where he had been or where he should be now. Wouldn't it be better if we allowed the Holy Spirit to work on us and not leave? Wouldn't it be better if we allowed the Holy Spirit to work on us and stay in God's fold than it would be to go away and have Him bring us back? The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. The Bible says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Remember where you were with God, where you are with God. And if those two things are not the same, go back. Because the next thing he says is repent. People who go astray need to repent. Did you know that Jesus repented? Yes, he did. But not for any sins he committed because he had none. But he repented of my sin and yours in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he was repenting of my sin. And I have read that the way to heaven is consecrated by Jesus' footsteps. And that includes how to repent. It's fascinating. Now, some people will say this sounds a lot like criticism. Am I being critical? Think about this. You see someone who's asleep. You wake them up. You tell them they were asleep. Is that criticism? No, it's not criticism. It's just a statement of fact. You're out for your morning walk. You see your neighbor's house on fire. You run up to the door, bash it in if you have to, wake them up, get them out of the house. Are you being critical? No. You're just trying to save their life. Your house is burning down. You're criticizing me. No, I'm not. I'm just stating a fact. You want to stay in there? I can't force you to leave. But you want to stay alive? Please come out. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. Many people are afraid of being criticized or being called critical. And by the grace of God, you'll notice that I'm not afraid. But many are afraid, and so they go along to get along, and they either lead or follow each other to hell in their delusion for satanic unity. Ellen White said that there was only one time that the whole world was under one banner, and that was under Satan's banner. And we cry, and we cry, and we cry for unity. Well... You want unity? What about this? 1 John 5, verse 19. The whole world lies in wickedness. Shall we be wicked with the rest of the world because we want unity? I think not. All we like sheep have gone astray, the Bible says. The Bible says there is none good, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. The Bible says the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. But the Bible also says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and so must we. When the Spirit of God pricks your heart 
and you no longer want to be wicked, what then? Do you continue going astray? Or do you come back? Well, the Holy Spirit has pricked your heart and said, what must I do to be saved? And so the Lord saves you out of your sins. And then you become the butt of jokes and the object of scorn and ridicule from your former companions. But now you are following the Lord, not the crowd. And when you go with the Lord, you know you will not go astray. Tell me, who went astray? The eight people on the ark or the rest of the world? Yes, indeed. Now, at the risk of being personal, I'll tell you this. I have always been different. <laughs> Short hair in a day when everybody was having long hair. I always knew where I was in the class picture. And I believe that was of the Lord's design because I think and I am sure that he has had his hand on me since I was born. I just didn't know it till later. I didn't know I was astray. It was normal. But God had to tell me. And when he did... Thank God I listened. I didn't get angry at him because he told me that I had been wrong all them years. I didn't get angry at him. I just listened. And I said, thank you. And he trained me through my parents. And they didn't even know they were training me to go to heaven. But I told them that once when I went to visit them. And as I, it was a long drive and my mom gave me a bunch of things, which we still have. I don't believe I even took them out of the box yet. Oh man. And uh, I was sitting there at the kitchen table with them in their little home and I said, Mom, Dad, if I get to heaven, I'll have you to thank for it. And my mom said, but we didn't raise you as a Christian. And I said, I know. But the way you did raise me made it easy for God to get to me. And my mom said, I never thought of it that way. And I said, well, I just did. <laughs> but I believe that the Holy Spirit had me say that to them. So, the Lord had his hand on me and he was guiding me through my parents and uh, other means until I fully made up my mind to follow him. And he let me do that. And, you know, I'm sure when I see him face to face in heaven, he's not going to go, Roy, you wouldn't believe how much hassle I had to go through with you. I don't think he's going to do that. Uh, uh, I'm going to feel like I never, I never get out of his hug and his embrace. And it's a problem with God's people that we, we don't want to hear. A lot of times we don't want to hear any negative thing about anybody. We want to stick our head in the sand and call it good. Unfortunately, there's a lion walking about seeking who may devour. And if you're the ostrich and your head's in the sand, the lion is still there. Pretending he's not isn't going to help you. And you know, it's not just the outside world that has a problem. It's God's people also. And I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm just saying it because it's real. And look here, folks. The, the criticism, the, any criticism that might be interpreted as that is not aimed at any one particular person. Unless I know for sure that somebody is doing what God told Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 8. 
you know, Ezekiel was in uh, Babylon with the captives, and God was showing him what was going on back home in the church, right? Ezekiel chapter 8, I'll just go to verse 5 and 6. And then he said unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, where's that? In the temple? Huh? In God's church? Hmm? This image of jealousy in the entry. Ooh! What's that doing there? Well, his people put it there. And he said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations. What do you call them? Abominations. That the house of... Uh-oh. It isn't the Babylonians. It isn't the Assyrians. It isn't the Russians. It isn't the Canadians. It's who? It's Israel. I hope you understand. The great abominations that the house of Israel committed here. That I should go far off from my sanctuary. But, and unless you think that things couldn't get worse, turn yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. You think it's bad? Just wait a little longer and look over there. You think that's bad? Look over here. Who went astray? Since we're talking about going astray, who went astray? God's people. Why? Because their leaders went astray. I know it's not pleasant saying these things, but they have to be said. If I was the one that went astray, I would surely want to know. I would not want to deceive myself into thinking that everything's okay, when it definitely is not okay. So it's with sadness, but with knowledge, that God tells his prophet these things. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. And then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in. And behold, the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing, and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand. And a thick cloud of incense went up. And he said to me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chamber of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not. For the Lord hath forsaken the earth. Remember what God said? They do these abominations that drive me far from my sanctuary. God has to forsake things like that. And he said also unto me, as if that wasn't bad enough, turn thee yet again and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Who went astray? Who went astray there? 
Israel and her leaders. Who went astray in Christ's day? The leaders. The leaders of the church. Who departed from the faith? The leaders. Now today, you hear of faithful, Bible-preaching pastors being fired, canceled, or uninvited. When they preach the truth of the three angels' messages, they are attacked by false shepherds whose main concern seems to be their own pocketbooks while disguising their perfidy under the cloak of pretended zeal for God's remnant church. Spare us the platitudes. Spare us the mockery. Spare us the appearance of righteousness without substance. One day it will all be overturned. Just as Jesus turned over the money changers' tables. One day God will take the work into his own hands. One day God will have a people who take the Bible and the Bible only as their rule of faith. There will be no more opinions. There will be no more deductions. And there will be no more decisions of councils and committees. There will be no more following the majority. We will have one rule of faith. And there will be no more mixing of truth and error. No. Somehow, I, and I think the Lord has brought this thought to my mind just now, the statements that were made by um, committees about whether or not the Holy Spirit has the right to tell you what to do and whether you have the right to listen to the Holy Spirit in your conscience. Right? You remember those? Those statements were made because they don't want the Holy Spirit to talk to you. They don't want you to listen to the Holy Spirit because if the Holy Spirit is leading you, you're not following them. So follow the Lord and Him only. He leads into the green pastures. He leads by the still waters. I can't imagine what heaven will be like, but I think I have a picture of green pastures. Still waters, a sort of a nice house, quiet, peace, and in His presence forevermore, And no more go astray. No more go astray. God is good to us in revealing these things to us. They help us to stay on the road we should be on. What is the message that is scorned and derided by you? Many of God's people today, it's the three angels' messages the ones that we give lip service to, especially the third, the truth about worldly, that is, satanic forces conspiring against his sheep. God gives his message through humble instruments. Thank God. And once again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in God's behalf. And... I believe, and this is one thing that God told me early on when he first found me. He said, I want you to help me hold on to what I have. Now, does that sound reasonable to you? I believe that the Lord told me that. He wants me to help him hold on to what he already has. And so by his grace, I will do that in his house, whenever I have opportunity. And that's his work, and I'm glad to do it. And I don't care what happens afterwards. Amen.